Hill, Reading, December 1864. My dear Edward, you have asked me to put on paper my recollections of Aunt Jane, and to do so would be both on your account and hers a labor of love if I had but sufficiency of material. I am sorry to say that my reminiscences are few, surprisingly so considering how much I saw of her in childhood and how much intercourse we had in later years. I look back to that first period but find little that I can grasp of any substance or certainty. It seems now all so shadowy. I recollect the frequent visits of my two aunts and how they walked in wintry weather through the sloppy lane between Steventon and Dean in pattens, usually worn at that time even by gentlewomen. Jane Austen's nephew, James Edward Austen Lee, had written to his two sisters, Caroline and Anna, asking them to send him memories of their famous relation. Thanks to Brother Henry Austen's biographical notice in the two-volume set of Persuasion and Northanger Abbey published shortly after her death, Jane Austen was now known to be the author of those two novels, as well as Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Mansfield Park, and Emma. Edward, whose goal was no doubt at least partially to capitalize on the fact that his aunt was now a household name, was writing a memoir of her life and wanted to be able to include lots of details. Jane left behind no diary, and Cassandra Austen, who had died in 1845, prevented many details about her beloved sister and companion from reaching posterity by burning a great deal of their correspondence, so Edward had to piece her story together from other sources. What I find so striking about the very first memory Anna Lefroy mentions, that of her aunts wearing pattens, is that Jane Austen so rarely provides specific information about the clothes worn by the characters in her novels. We only get passing references. In Pride and Prejudice, for example, the Bennet girls observe that Mr. Bingley wears a blue coat. In Northanger Abbey, Mrs. Allen advises Catherine to put on her white gown to visit Eleanor Tilney because she always wears white. Jane Austen probably did not feel that she needed to go into great detail because, for all she knew, she was only writing for her contemporaries, people for whom long descriptions of dress would be unnecessary and downright boring. That's not to say that she herself was not interested in fashion. We can see in her surviving letters that she was a savvy and economical shopper and a very conscious wearer and re-wearer of clothing. In her letters to Cassandra, she makes frequent mention of mending or making over petticoats and gowns, she describes what people were wearing at balls, and she discusses updates in fashion trends. Some of this is just making conversation, but letters were also one of the only ways that people in different places, especially those living in the country as opposed to living in town, London, had any hope of keeping up with regularly changing waistline heights, bodice depths, sleeve lengths, trim options, and accessories. So, what exactly were patents? And why were they needed on the sloppy lane between Steventon and Dean? Well, according to Google Maps, that walk takes at least 30 minutes these days. And as you can see from the street view, while the landscape and surroundings haven't changed a whole lot, there's definitely a paved road now. A dirt path in winter would certainly get sloppy. Patents were an extremely common accessory across society regardless of economic status in France, the UK, and the American colonies. This presentation focuses on examples and references specific to those places between the early 18th and early 19th centuries. I haven't looked into their use in other parts of the world or other eras. During the Georgian period, 1714 to the 1830s, shoes for female presenting people were usually made of very delicate materials. Silk satin and brocade were common, as was kid leather, which was quite thin and supple, more like wearing a glove on your foot than the sturdy, thick material used for leather shoes nowadays. Rain, snow, and mud created hazardous, slippery conditions, and the paths, streets, and gutters could be counted on to collect the general detritus from humans and animals. Even cobblestone surfaces were extremely mucky before underground plumbing was introduced to cities and towns. Such flimsy footwear could easily be soaked through or permanently stained in a matter of seconds. Not to mention the difficulty of removing all that grime from one's long skirts. Like Lizzie Bennet's petticoat, six inches deep in mud, from her three-mile walk to Netherfield after the rainfall that made Jane ill enough to warrant Lizzie's visit. Whether Lizzie's petticoat was a sturdy, under-petticoat worn for warmth, or something finer like silk or muslin, it could be very time-consuming for a servant to clean, and that servant would need to know a great deal about different soaps and which type was best to use for which textile. 
Patens provided a barrier between the wearer's feet and hems and whatever might be in the paths or streets where they were walking. From the 1740s to about the 1790s, patens had thick leather soles and straps that tied over the arch of the foot. The hallmark of this earlier style, which were also confusingly for historians sometimes referred to as clogs, we'll talk more about this distinction later, was that they had a slanted and notched base so that the sole and heel of the fashionable shoes could sit snugly right up against the sole of the paten. There are extant patens and clogs from this period with plain wool or leather straps, but some were made in the same highly decorative brocade as the shoes. I have to admit, I think that kind of defeats the purpose, although I guess it's better for the brocade patens to get covered in mud instead of the brocade shoes. The other common type of paten from the 18th century, more often seen in paintings and illustrations being worn by working people, is a design rather like very short stilts. The soles are made of wood and have iron risers, often in the shape of a ring, attached to the bottom, physically lifting the wearer a few inches up instead of merely adding an extra sole under the shoe. This painting from 1738 in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., called The Scullery Maid, shows the subject wearing this style of paten. I've zoomed in and lightened the image quite a bit, and if you look carefully under her shoe, you can see the outline of the iron risers. An archaeological dig in Colonial Williamsburg several years ago produced the remnants of a pair of patens with iron risers in a wavy rectangular shape rather than in a circle. There was a collaborative effort among several of the historic trade shops to recreate the patents, which is all covered by an excellent blog post on the Two Nerdy History Girls page. There is even video of one of the tinsmith apprentices walking in them. Talk about living history! I've been focusing on shoes so far, but I'm just going to take a moment to discuss boots as well. While we would normally think of boots as sturdier and more capable of standing up to different terrains and surfaces than other types of shoes, Georgian boots were not much more practical in terms of material. In the 1790s, lace-up half boots, boots that came to the high ankle as opposed to all the way up the calf, came into fashion for female presenting people. These were made in leather as well as woven fabrics like silk and nankeen, a sturdy cotton from China, either with a very small heel or no heel at all. The costumer for the 1995 Pride and Prejudice miniseries had Lizzie Bennet tromping over to Netherfield in a pair of dark brown leather half boots. These probably would have done an excellent job of matching the mud, but not of preventing it from seeping in. Evidence would suggest that patens were more likely to be worn over shoes than boots, though I will not say they were never worn over boots because as soon as I do, someone will come running with a drawing or painting depicting patens being worn over boots. As shoe styles and fashions changed, with heels gradually decreasing both in width and height over time, it was necessary for the design of patens to adapt as well. Once the soles of slippers became almost completely flat around 1800, patens no longer needed the notched heel at the back. There are extant patens with low soles made from leather or cork and no risers after this period, but it appears that the style of flat wooden soles with iron risers came to be adopted more broadly. This is the case with the pair of patens I purchased on eBay in 2022. They were advertised simply as patens, 18th century overshoes, museum relics, with very few details about their provenance or history. The seller in Germany had obtained them from a museum DX session, but I do not know if they were made in Germany. The only hint as to when they might have been made and worn is that the front of the wooden soles are slightly squared off, which leads me to conclude that they are from after 1815, when shoes became less pointy in the toe. Otherwise, they are very typical. The round iron rings attach to the wooden soles with rivets, and I believe the leather straps attach with nails or brads. The straps have holes punched in them for ties, but I do not think the thin leather cords on mine are original. I suspect they would have been ribbon or twill tape. The iron rings only add about an inch and a half of height, but there are extants on which the wooden soles sit slightly higher. The soles are darkened with age and show several cracks and small holes, possibly from worms or termites, and the leather straps are dried out and cracked. One interesting detail is that even though the two wooden soles are identical and were cut on a straight last, I'm fairly certain from how the straps have solidified into a specific angle that each pattern was worn consistently on the same foot, one on the right and one on the left. There is not much else I can speculate on about who they belong to or how they came to be in a museum collection. But, considering how much harm can be done to wood, leather, and iron by exposure to the elements, and how often only a single ring is recovered after the wood has disintegrated away, it was very gratifying to have found and been able to purchase a complete pair in such good shape. 
Jane Austen refers to patterns in two of her six novels. Perhaps one of the best pieces of evidence of the prevalence and longevity of these practical items is that she mentions them in one of her earliest drafted works, Northanger Abbey, and in one of her last, Persuasion. This single, very small detail proves that Jane Austen need not have worried that readers of Northanger Abbey would be dismayed by how much places, manners, books, and opinions had changed in the 13 years since it had originally been sold and prepared for publication. Of course, readers today do not seem to mind the passage of over 200 years, but she could not have anticipated that. Catherine Moreland, during the tour of Northanger Abbey given by General Tilney, is surprised by how little the household resembles the mysterious, imposing edifices in her favorite Gothic novels. They took a slight survey of all, and Catherine was impressed beyond her expectation by their multiplicity and their convenience. The purposes for which a few shapeless pantries and a comfortless scullery were deemed sufficient at Fullerton were here carried on in appropriate divisions, commodious and roomy. The number of servants continually appearing did not strike her less than the number of their offices. Wherever they went, some patent girl stopped to curtsy or some footman in dishabille sneaked off. Yet this was an abbey. How inexpressibly different in these domestic arrangements from such as she had read about, from abbeys and castles in which, though certainly larger than Northanger, all the dirty work of the house was to be done by two pair of female hands at the utmost. How they could get through it all had often amazed Mrs. Allen, and when Catherine saw what was necessary here, she began to be amazed herself. In this passage, the person wearing pattens is a servant. But let's revisit something I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. I spoke of clogs as another term for the earlier 18th century style of overshoe with a notched leather sole and fabric or leather straps. Nowadays, when we hear the word clogs, we usually think of big carved wooden shoes with pointy toes. Here is an example of that type of footwear from this period. However, in Chapter 2 of Northanger Abbey, when Catherine is traveling to Bath with the Allens, we learn that the journey was performed with suitable quietness and uneventful safety. Neither robbers nor tempests befriended them, nor one lucky overturn to introduce them to the hero. Nothing more alarming occurred than a fear on Mrs. Allen's side of having once left her clogs behind her at an inn, and that fortunately proved to be groundless. It is difficult to imagine the highly fashionable Mrs. Allen wearing a pair of large, cumbersome wooden shoes, and though she is rather flighty, it is also difficult to imagine her losing track of them. But since Jane Austen began drafting Northanger Abbey in the late 18th century, it might make sense for these clogs to be the earlier notched sole style for heeled shoes. If Jane Austen had meant for Mrs. Allen to be understood as wearing the same type of overshoe as the serving girl, I believe she would have used the same term. This leads me to deduce that at least for Jane Austen, pattens was the term for the wood and iron overshoes worn by working people, whereas clogs referred to the fancier type made with leather and cloth or leather straps. Of course, it's impossible to know for sure. In Persuasion, we hear of the activity and bustle of the Christmas season at the home of the Musgroves, the family of Anne Elliot's sister Mary, contrasted with the cacophony that greets Anne and Lady Russell upon their arrival in Bath. Immediately surrounding Mrs. Musgrove were the little Harvilles, whom she was sedulously guarding from the tyranny of the two children from the cottage, expressly arrived to amuse them. On one side was a table occupied by some chattering girls cutting up silk and gold paper, and on the other were trestles and trays bending under the weight of brawn and cold pies, where riotous boys were holding high revel, the whole completed by a roaring Christmas fire which seemed determined to be heard in spite of all the noise of the others. Charles and Mary also came in, of course, during their visit, and Mr. Musgrove made a point of paying his respects to Lady Russell, and sat down close to her for ten minutes, talking with a very raised voice, but from the clamor of the children on his knees, generally in vain. It was a fine family piece. Mrs. Musgrove, who got Anne near her on purpose to thank her most cordially again and again for all her attentions to them, concluded a short recapitulation of what she had suffered herself by observing, with a happy glance round the room, that after all she had gone through, nothing was so likely to do her good as a little quiet cheerfulness at home. "'I hope I shall remember in future,' said Lady Russell, as soon as they were reseated in the carriage, "'not to call at Uppercross in the Christmas holidays.' Everybody has their taste in noises as well as in other matters, and sounds are quite innoxious or most distressing by their sort rather than their quantity. 
when Lady Russell not long afterwards was entering Bath on a wet afternoon and driving through the long course of streets from the old bridge to Camden Place, amidst the dash of other carriages, the heavy rumble of carts and drays, the bawling of newspaper men, muffin men, and milkmen, and the ceaseless clink of pattens, she made no complaint. No, these were noises which belonged to the winter pleasures. Her spirits rose under their influence, and like Mrs. Musgrove, she was feeling, though not saying, that after being long in the country, nothing could be so good for her as a little quiet cheerfulness. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. Please check the Virtual Jane Con website and schedule for all the other content coming out this weekend.